Hello everybody, Kimosabe here, coming at you with another video. This is off of business.financialpost webpage, a post by the Financial Post, with the topic of Canada waits for China to strike back after court rules against Huawei executive. It's spelled H-U-A-W-E-I, but it's pronounced Huawei. Kind of funky. Um, I'm just going to tell you guys who and what Huawei is because I didn't know so we're gonna have to find out together here so the Wikipedia page here says uh, Huawei Technologies Co. LID uh, is a Chinese multinational technology company it provides telecommunications equipment and sells consumer electronics smartphones and is headquartered in Shenzhen Guangdong this company was founded in 1987 by Ren Zhengfei, a former deputy regimental chief in the People's Liberation Army. Initially focused on manufacturing phone switches, Huawei was or has expanded its business to include building telecommunications networks, pr providing operational and consulting services and equipment to enterprises inside and outside of China, and manufacturing communications devices for the consumer market. Huawei has over 194,000 employees as of December 2019. Huawei has deployed its products and services in more than 170 countries. It overtook Ericsson in 2012 as the largest telecommunications equipment manufacturer in the world and overtook Apple in 2018 as the second largest manufacturer of smartphones in the world behind Samsung Electronics. In December 2019, Huawei reported that its annual revenue ha had risen to 121.72 billion US dollars in 2019. Although successfully internationally, Huawei has faced difficulties in some markets due to claims of undue state support and cybersecurity concerns, primarily from the United States government, the Huawei's infrastructure equipment may enable surveillance by the Chinese government. With the deployment of 5G wireless networks, there has been calls from the U.S. to prevent the use of products by Huawei or fellow Chinese telecommunications company ZTE by the U.S. and its allies. Huawei has argued that its projects posed no greater cybersecurity risk than those of any other vendor and that there is no evidence of the US espionage claims. Questions regarding Huawei's ownership and control as well as concerns regarding the extent of state support also remain. Huawei has also accused uh, has been accused of assisting in the surveillance of mass detention of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and re-education camps. In the midst of ongoing trade war between China and the United States, Huawei was restricted from doing commerce with the U.S. companies due to alleged previous willful violations of U.S. sanctions against Iran. On 29th of June 2019, U.S. President Donald Trump reached an agreement to resume trade talks with China and announced that he would ease the aforementioned sanctions on Huawei. Huawei cut 600 jobs at its Santa Clara Research Center in June, and in December 2019, founded Ren Zhengfei said he was moving the center to Canada because the restrictions would block them from interacting with U.S. employees. Name. According to the company founder Ren Zhengfei, the name Huawei comes from a slogan he saw on a wall. Zhenghui Yu Hui, meaning China has promise, Zhenghui Yu Hui, when he was starting up the company and needed a name, Zhang Hui and Hui means China, while Yu Hui means promising to show promise. Huawei has also been translated as splendid achievement or China is able, which are possible readings to the name. In Chinese pinyin, the name is Huawei and pronounced Xiaoyi in Mandarin Chinese. In Cantonese, the name is translated with Jiayu Ting as Huawei and pronounced Huawei. However, pronunciation of Huawei by non Chinese varies in other countries, for example, Ho Ahui in the Netherlands. The company had considered changing the name in English as it was concerned that the non Chinese may find the name hard to pronounce, but decided to keep the name and launched a name recognition campaign instead to encourage a pronunciation closer to Huawei using the words Huawei. History. Earlier years, during the 1980s, the Chinese government tried to modernize the country's underdeveloped telecommunications infrastructure. A core component of the telecommunications network 
was telephone exchange switches, and in the late 1980s, several Chinese research groups endeavored to acquire and develop the technology, usually through joint ventures with foreign companies. Ren Zhengfei, a former deputy director of the People's Liberation Army Engineering Corps, founded Huawei in 1987 in Shenzhen. The company reports that it had an RMB 21,000 registered capital at the time of its founding. Ren sought to reverse engineer foreign technologies with local researchers at a time when all of China's telecommunications technology was imported from abroad. Ren hoped to build a domestic Chinese telecommunications company that could compete with and ultimately replace foraging competitors. During its first years, the company's business model consisted mainly of reselling private brands exchange, PBX switches, imported from Hong Kong. Meanwhile, it was reverse engineering imported switches and investing heavily in research and development to manufacture its own technologies. By the 1990s, the company had approximately 600 R&D staff and began its own independent commercialization of PBX switches targeting hotels and small enterprises. The company's first major breakthrough came in 1993 when it launched its C and C08 program control telephone switch. It was by far the most powerful switch available in China at the time by initially deploying in small cities and rural areas and placing emphasis on service and customability. The company gained market share and made its way into the mainstream market. Huawei also won a key control to build the first national telecommunications network for the People's Liberation Army, a deal one employee described as small in terms of our overall business, but large in terms of our relationships. In 1994, founder Ren Zhengfei had a meeting with Party General Secretary Jiang Ziming, telling him that switching equipment technology was related to national security and that a nation that did not have its own switching equipment was like one that lacked its own military. Jiang reportedly agreed with this assessment. In the 1990s, Canadian telecom giant Nortel outsourced production of their entire product line to Huawei. They subsequently outsourced much of their product engineering to Huawei as well. Another major turning point for the company came in 1996 when the government in Beijing adopted an explicit policy of supporting domestic telecommunications manufacturers and restricting access to foraging competitors. Huawei was promoted by both the government and the military as a national camp champion and established new research and development offices. Foraging expansion. In 1997, Huawei won a contract to provide fixed line networks products to Hong Kong company Hutchinson Huanghua. Later that year, Huawei launched its wireless GSM based products and eventually expanded to offer CDMA and UMTS. In 1999, the company opened a research and development R&D center in Bangalore, India to develop a wide range of telecom software. In May 2003, Huawei per partnered with 3Com on a joint venture known as H3C, which was focused on enterprise networking equipment. It marked 3Com's re-entrance into the high-end core routers and switch market after having abandoned it in 2000 to focus on other businesses. 3Com bought out Huawei's share of its ventures in 2006 for US $882 million. In 2005, Huawei's foraging contract orders exceeded its domestic sales for the first time. Huawei signed a global framework agreement with Vodafone. This agreement marked the first time a telecommunications equipment supplier from China had received approved supplier status from Vodafone global supply chain. Huawei also signed a contract with British Telecom, BT, for the development of its multi-service access networks, MSAN, and transmission equipment equipment for BT's 21st Century Network, 21CM. In 2007, Huawei began a joint venture with U.S. security software vendor Semantic Corporation, known as Huawei Semantic, which aimed to provide end-to-end -end solutions for network data storage and security. Huawei brought out Semtech share in the venture in 2012, with the New York Times noting that Symantec had fears that the partnership would prevent it from obtaining US, United States government classified information about cyber threats. In May 2008, Australian carrier Optus announced that it would establish a technology research facility with Huawei in Sydney. In October 2008, Huawei reached an agreement to contribute to a new GSM-based HSPA network being 
deployed jointly by Canadian characters Bell Mobility and Telus Mobility, joined by Nokia Simeon's networks. Huawei delivered one of the world's first LTE slash EPC commercial networks for Telia Sanera in Oslo, Norway in 2009. In July 2010, Huawei was included in the Global Fortune 500 2010 list published by the U.S. magazine Fortune for the first time on the strength of annual sales of U.S. $21.8 billion and net profit of $2.67 billion. In October 2012, it was announced that Huawei was moved its had moved it would move its UK headquarters to Green Park Reading Berkshire in September 2017 Huawei created a narrowband OIT cityware network using a one network one platform and applications construction model utilizing IoT cloud computing big data and other net next generation information and communications technology it also aims to be one of the world's five largest cloud players in the near future in April 2019, Huawei established Huawei Malaysia Global Training Center, MGTC, at Cyberjaya, Malaysia, which is Huawei's first training center outside of China. In September 20, 2019, Huawei filed a defamification lawsuit against a French researcher in a television show which had hosted her. The researcher with the Foundation for Strategic Research had noted that Ren Zheng Fai was a former PLA member and that Huawei's fa facts functions as an arm of the Chinese government. This was the first time that Huawei had sued a researcher for defamification for stating common opinions and recognized facts. Recent performance. As of the end of 2018, Huawei sold 200 million smartphones. They reported that strong customer demand for premium range smartphones helped the company reach consumer sales in excess of $52 billion in 2018. Huawei announced world revenues of $105.1 billion in 2018 with a net profit of $8.7 billion. Huawei Q1 2019 revenues were up 39% year over year at US $26.76 billion and in 2019 Huawei reported a revenue of U.S. $122 billion. Controversies. Huawei has faced criticism for various aspects of its operations, with its most prominent controversies having involved U.S. allegations of its products containing backdoors for Chinese government espionage consistent with domestic laws requiring Chinese citizens and companies to cooperate with state intelligence when warranted. Huawei executives have consistently denied these allegations, having stated that the company has never received any requests by the Chinese government to introduce backdoors in its equipment, would refuse to do so, and that the Chinese law did not compel them to do so. Espionage. Huawei has been at the center of espionage allegations over the Chinese 5G network equipment. In 2018, the United States passed a defense funding bill that contained a passage bearing the federal government from doing barring the federal government from doing business with Huawei and ZTE and several Chinese vendors of surveillance products due to security concerns. The Chinese government has threatened economic retaliation against countries that block Huawei's market access. Allegations of deception to subvert sanctions. On the 1st of December 2018, Huawei Vice Chairman and CFO Meng Wangzhou, daughter of company founder Ren Zhengfei, was arrested in Canada at, at the request of U.S. authorities. She faced extradition to the United States on charges of violating sanctions against Iran. On the 22nd of August 2018, an arrest warrant was issued by the U.S. District Court of Eastern District of New York, man was charged with conspiracy to defraud multiple international institutions, according to the prosecutor. The warrant was based on allegations of a conspiracy to defraud banks, which were clearing money that was claimed to be for Huawei, but was actually for Skycom, an entity claimed to be entirely controlled by Huawei, which was said to be dealing in Iran, contrary to sanctions. None of the allegations have been proven in court. And on the 11th of December 2018, Meng was released on bail. On the 28th of January 2019, U.S. federal prosecutors formally indicted Meng and Huawei for with 13 courts of bank and wire fraud. In order to mask sale of U.S. technology in Iran that is illegal under sanctions, obstruction of justice, and misappropriating trade secrets, the department also filed a formal extradition request for Meng with Canadian authorities that same day. Huawei responded to the charges and said that it denies that 
it or its subsidiary or affiliate has committed any of the asserted violations as well as asserted bang was similarly innocent the china ministry of industry and information technology believed the charges brought on by the united states were unfair in november 2018 huawei announced that it will pay rmb2 billion U.S. $286 million in bonuses to its staff and double their October salaries as a reward for their efforts to counter the effect of the recent U.S. trade sanctions on their supply chain. Shortly after Meng's detention, Chinese authorities arrested Canadian former diplomat Michael Korvig and consulted Michael Spavor on charges of espionage. This was widely seen as a retaliatory move and other subsequent arrests were also questioned. These arrests have been viewed as hostage diplomacy, as has the subsequent arrest of Australian Yang Hengeng. Canada is not the only one grappling with the Gordian knot of national security. Global alliance and competitive market issues that Huawei represents, wrote the Financial Post, noting that Australia and New Zealand have banned Huawei equipment. Britain is weighing its options, and the situation in the United States is complicated. In September 2019, Microsoft top lawyer and President Brad Smith expressed concern about the continued U.S. ban of Huawei products and services. In an interview with Bloomberg Business week, he remarked that the ban shouldn't be imposed without a sound basis in fact, logic, and the rule of law. Microsoft Corporation, which applies Windows 10 for a Huawei PCs, says the allegations by the Trump administration that Huawei is a genuine national security threat to the U.S. are not supported by any evidence. In February 2020, U.S. government officials claimed that Huawei had, in, had the ability to covertly expose Float backdoors intended for law enforcement officials in carrier equipment like antennas and routers since 2009. Allegations of intellectual property thrust. Huawei has been accused of various instances of intellectual property theft and against parties such as Nortel, Cisco Systems, and T Mobile US, where a Huawei employee had photographed a robotic arm used to stress test smartphones and taken a fingertip from the robot. The management of the company claims the US government persecutes it because Huawei. Huawei's expansion can affect American business interests. In February 2020, the United States Department of Justice charged Huawei with racketeering and conspiring to steal trade secrets from six U.S. firms. Allegations of involvement in, in Xangjiang re-education camps. In 2019, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute accused Huawei of assisting in the mass detention of Uyghurs in Xangjiang re-education camps. Huawei technology is regarded as critical by whom? To the Chinese government's pervasive systems of surveillance of the Uyghurs and other ethnic minority groups. U.S. business restrictions. In August 2018, the National Defense Organi Authorization Act for Fiscal Year 2019, NDAA 2019, was signed into law, containing a provision that banned Huawei and ZTE equipment from being used by the U.S. federal government, citing security concerns. Huawei filed a lawsuit over the act in March 2019, alleging it to be un unconstitutional because it specifically targeted Huawei without granting a chance to provide a rebuttal of due process. On the 15th of May 2019, the Department of Commerce added Huawei and 70 foreign subsidiaries and affiliates to its entity list under the Export Administration regulations, citing the company having been in Indicted for knowingly and willfully causing the export and re-export sales supply directly and indirectly of goods, technology and services, banking and other financial services from the United States to Iran and the government of Iran without obtaining a license from the Department of Treasury, Office of Forge and Assets Control, OFAC. This restricts U.S. companies from doing business with Huawei without a government license. Various U.S. companies immediately froze their businesses with Huawei to comply with this regulation, including Google, which removes its ability to certify future devices and updates for the Android operating system with licensed Google Mobile Services GMS, such as Google Play Store, as well as Broadcom, Intel, Qualcomm, Microsoft, X. Excellent 
and Western Digital, the German chipmaker Infineon Technologies, also voluntarily suspended its businesses with Huawei pending assessments. It was reported that Huawei did have a limited stockpile of U.S. source parts obtained prior to the sanction. On the 17th of May 2019, Huawei voluntarily suspended its membership to JED. C as a temporary measure until the restrictions imposed by the U.S. government are removed. Speaking to China, if they're removed, speaking to Chinese media, Huawei founder Ren Zhengfei accused U.S. politicians of underestimating the company's strength and explained that in terms of 5G technologies, others won't be able to catch up with Huawei in two or three years. We have sacrificed ourselves and our families for our ideal to stand on top of the world to reach this ideal sooner or later there will be conflict with the U.S. Kevin Wolf, an international trade lawyer and former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration during the Obama administration, argued that Huawei could not even use the open source Android open source project AOSP code as it could fall under U.S. trade regulations as technology of U.S. origin because Google is the majority developer. In China, it is normal for Android phones including those of Huawei to not include Google Play Store or GMS as Google does not do business in the region. Phones are typically bundled with an, with an AOSP based distribution built around an OEM's own software suit including either a first party app store run by OEM such as Huawei's own app gallery or a third party service. Google issued a statement asserting that user access to Google Play on existing Huawei devices would not be disrupted. Huawei made a similar pledge of continued support for existing devices including security patches but did not make any statements regarding the availability of future Android versions such as Android 10. On 19th of May 2019, the Department of Commerce granted Huawei a temporary three-month license to continue doing business with U.S. companies for the purposes of maintaining its existing smartphone and telecom products without interruption while its long-term solutions are determined. On the 22nd of May 2019, arms holdings are suspended its businesses with Huawei, including all active contracts, support entitlements, and any pending engagements, although it is a Japanese-owned company based in the UK. Arm cited that its intellectual property contained technology of the US origin that it believed were covered over the Department of Commerce order. This prevents Huawei from manufacturing chips that use the Arm architecture. It was also reported that several Asian wireless carriers, including Japan SoftBank and KDDI and Taiwan Taiwan's Kanghua Telecom and Taiwan Mobile had suspended the sale of upcoming Huawei devices such as the P30 Lite, citing uncertainties over the effects of the US sanctions on the availability of the Android platform. NTT Docomo similarly suspended pre-orders of a new Huawei phones without citing any reasoning. On the 23rd of May, May 2019, it was reported that the SD Association had removed Huawei from its list of members, implementing a revocation of its membership to the association. The same day, Toshiba briefly suspended all shipments to Huawei as a temporary measure while determining whether or not they were selling U.S.-made components or technologies to Huawei. Panasonic also stated that it determined its business relationship to be in compliance with the U.S. law and would not suspend it. The next day, the Wi-Fi Alliance also temporarily restricted Huawei's membership. On the 24th of May 2019, Huawei told Reuters and FedEx attempted to divert two packages sent from Japan and addressed to Huawei in China to the United States and tried to divert two more packages sent from Vietnam to Huawei offices elsewhere in Asia, all without their authorization. At first, FedEx China claimed that media reports are not true, and on May 20. Uh, 28th. However, they apologized on their Chinese social media account for the for the fact that a small number of Huawei shipments were misrouted, and claimed that there are no external parties that require FedEx to ship these shipments. On the 29th of May 2019, it was reported that Huawei was once again listed as a member of JEDEC and the, the SD Association Wi-Fi Alliance. In addition, while the science organization IEEE had initially banned Huawei employees from peer reviewing papers and handling papers as editors on May 30th, 2019, citing legal concerns, that BAM was also revoked on June 3rd, 2019.
On the 31st of May 2019, it was reported that Huawei had temporarily stopped its smartphone production lines. On the 17th of June 2019, it was reported that Huawei was preparing for a sales drop of U.S. $30 billion, selling 40 million to 60 million smartphones less than than last year in overseas markets. On the 29th of June 2019 at the G20 summit, Trump and Chinese President and General Secretary Xi Jinping agreed to resume trade negotiations. Trump made statements in implement, implementing plans to ease the restrictions on U.S. companies doing business with Huawei, explaining that they had sold a tremendous amount of products to the company and that they were not exactly happy that they couldn't sell, and that he was referring to the equipment that there's no great national security problem with it. BBC News considered this move to be a significant concession. On the 25th of October 2019, Arms Holding stated that it would continue to allow Huawei to license the technology as it determined that its recent architectures were significant, sufficiently considered to be of British origin and not subjected to the sanctions. And on May 15th, uh, 20, 2020, the U.S. Department of Commerce extended its export restrictions to bar Huawei from producing semiconductors derived from Bechtel technology or software of U.S. origin, even if the manufacturing is performed overseas. Replacement Operating Systems During the sanctions, it was noted that Huawei had been working on its own in-house operating system codenamed Huangmen OS. In an interview with Dai Welt, Executive Richard Yu stated that an in-house OS could be used as a plan B if it were prevented from using Android or Windows as a result of U.S. action, but that he would prefer to work with the ecosystems of Google and Microsoft. Efforts to develop an in-house OS at Huawei date back to as far as 2012. Huawei filed trademarks for the name ARC, ARC OS, and Harmony in Europe, which were speculated to be connected to this OS. OS means operating system. In June 2019, Huawei Communications VP Andrew Williamson told Reuters that the company was testing Huangmeng in China and that it could be ready in months. However, in July 2019, Chairman Lang Huai, Senior Vice President Catherine Cheng, stated that Huangmeng OS was not actually intended as a mobile operating system for smartphones and was actually an embedded operating system designed for Internet of Things, IoT, hardware. In September 2019, Huawei began offering the Chinese Linux distribution Deepin as an optional preloaded operating system on a selected MateBook models in China as an alternative to Windows. Corporate Affairs Huawei classifies itself as a collective entity and prior to 2019 did not refer to itself as a private company. Richard McGregor, author of The Party, The Secret World of China's Communist Rulers, said that this is a differential distinction that has been essential to the company's receipt of state support of, at crucial points in its development. McGregor argued that Huawei's status as a genuine collective is doubtful. Huawei's position has shifted in 2019 when Dr. Song Liping, Huawei's chief legal officer, commented on the U.S. government ban, said politicians in the U.S. are using the strength of their entire nation to come after a private company. Emphasis added. Leader ship Reng Zhengfei is the founder and CEO of Huawei and has the power to veto any decisions made by the board of directors. Board of directors. Huawei disclosed its list of board of directors for the first time in 2010. Lang Huai is the current chair of the board. As of 2019, the members of the board are Lang Huai, Zhou Ping, Zhejiang, Ho Hukun, Meng Wazhou, CFO and deputy chairwoman, currently out on bail in Vancouver after being arrested there on the 1st of December 2018 after an extradition request of the U.S. authorities on suspicion of Iran sanctions evasion, Ding Yang, Yu Chengdong, Wang Taiyo, Exu Wenwei, Sun Heng Chei, Shen Lefang, Peng Zhong Yang, He Qingwo, Lai Yingto, Ren Zhengfei, Yo Fuhai, Tai Jingwen, and Yan Laida. Executives Zhou Ping is the chairman of Huawei Device, Huawei's mobile phone division, Huawei's chief ethics and compliance officer, Zhou Dai Kui, Kui who is also, Huawei's 
Communist Party Committee Secretary. Their chief legal officer is Song Luping. Ownership. Huawei claims it is an employee-owned company, but it remains a point of dispute. Ren Zhengfei retains approximately 1% of the shares of Huawei's holding company, Huawei's investments in holding, with the remainders of the shares held by a trade union committee, not a trade union per se, and the international government's procedures of this committee, its members, its leaders, or how they are selected, all remained undisclosed to the public. That is claimed to be representative of Huawei's employee sh shareholders. The company's trade union committee is registered with and pay dues to the Shenzhen Federation of All China Federation of Trade Unions, which is effectively controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. This is also due to elimination to a, a, a limitation in Chinese law preventing limited liability companies from having more than 50 shareholders. About half of Huawei staff participate in this scheme. Foraging employees are not eligible and hold what the company calls virtual restricted shares. These shares are non-tradable and are allocated to reward performance. When employees leave Huawei, their shares revert to the company, which compensates them for their holding. Although employee shareholders receive dividends, their shares do not entitle them to any direct influence in management decisions, but enables them to vote for members of the 115-person representative commission for a pre-selected list of candidates. The representative commission selects Huawei's holding board of directors and board of supervisors. Scholars have found that after a few stages of historical morphing, employees do not own a part of Huawei through their shares. Instead, the virtual stock is a contract right, not a property right. It gives the holder no voting power in either Huawei Tech or Huawei Holding, cannot be transferred, and is cancelled when the employee leaves the firm, subject to a renumation payment from Huawei Holdings to UC at a low fixed price. Partners. As of the beginning of 2010, approximately 80% of the world's top 50 telecom companies have worked with Huawei. Prominent partners include Bell Canada, BT, Clearwire, Cox Communications, Globe Telecom, Motorola, Orange PLDT, Portugal Telecom, PTCL, T-Mobile, Talk Talk, and Vodafone. Since 2000. 16 German camera company Lycia has established a partnership with Huawei and Lycia cameras will be co-engineered into Huawei smartphones including the P and Mate series. The first smartphones to, to be co-engineered with the Lycia camera was Huawei P9. In 2020, Huawei partners with Dutch navigation device company TomTom Tom for Google Map Alternative products and services. Huawei is organized around three core business seg segments. One, telecom carrier networks building telecommunication networks and services. Two, enterprise businesses providing equipment, software, and services to enterprise customers, e.g. government solutions. See Huawei 4G ELTE. And three, devices manufacturing electronic communication devices. Huawei announced its enterprise business in January 2011 to provide network infrastructure, fixed and wireless communications, data center, and cloud commute, computing solutions for global telecommunications customers. Telecom networks. Huawei's core network solutions offer mobile and fixed soft switches, plus next generation home location register and internet protocol multimedia subsystems IMS. Huawei sells XDSL passive optical network PON and next generation PON NG PON on a single platform. The company also offers mobile infrastructure, broadband access, and service provider routers and switches SPERS R S P R S Huawei's software products include service delivery platforms SDPS BSS's a rich communication suite and digital home and mobile office solutions. Global services. Huawei Global Services provides telecommunications operators with equipment to build and operate networks as well as consulting and engineering services to improve operational efficiencies. These include network integration services such as those for mobile and fixed networks, assurance services such as network safety, and learning services such as 
competency consulting devices. Huawei's devices division provides white label products to content service providers including USB modems, wireless modems and wireless routers for mobile Wi-Fi, embedded modules, fixed wireless terminals, wireless gateways, set top boxes, mobile handsets and video products. Huawei also produces and sells a variety of devices under its own name such as IDEOS smartphones and tablet PCs and Huawei smartwatch. Huawei History of Huawei Phones. In July 2003, Huawei established their handset department, and by 2004, Huawei shipped their first phone, the C300. The U626 was Huawei's first 3G phone in June 2005, and in 2006, Huawei launched the first Vodafone branded 3G handset. The V710, the U. 8220 was Huawei's first Android smartphone and was unveiled in MWC 2009 at CES 2012. Huawei introduced the Ascend range starting with the Ascend P1S at MWC 2012. Huawei announced Huawei launched the Ascend D1 in September 2012, Huawei launched their first 4G ready phone, the Ascend P1 LTE at CES 2013. Huawei launched the Ascend D2 and the Ascend Mate at WMC 2013. The Ascend P2 was launched as the world's first LTE Cat 4 smartphone. In June 2013, Huawei launched the Ascend P6 and in December 2013, Huawei introduced Honor as a subsidiary independent brand in China. At CES 2014, Huawei launched the Ascend Mate 2 4G in 2014, and at MWC 2014, Huawei launched the MediaPad X1 tablet and Ascend G6 4G smartphone. Uh, 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 other launched in 2014 included the Ascend P7 in May 2014, the Ascend Mate 7, the Ascend G7, and the Ascend P7 Sapphire edition as China's first 4G smartphones with a Sapphire screen. In January 2015, Huawei discontinued the Ascend brand for its flagship phones and launched the new P-Series with the Huawei P8. Huawei also partnered with Google to build the Nexus 6P in 2015. The current models in the P and the Mate lines, the Mate 30, Mate 30 Pro, Mate 35G, Mate 30 Pro 5G, P30, P30 Pro, Mate 20, Mate 20 Pro, and Mate 20X were released in 2018 and 2019. EMUI Emotion User Interface. Emotion UI EMUI is a ROM slash OS developed by Huawei Technologies Co. Lid and based on Google's Android's open source project AOSP, EUI is pre-installed on most Huawei smartphone devices and its subsidiaries, the Honor series. The latest version of EMUI is EMUI 10. Competitive Position. Huawei Technologies Co. Lid is the world's largest telecom equipment maker and China's largest telephone network and equipment maker. With 3,442 patents, Huawei became the world's number one applicant for international patents in 2014. R&D Centers It has 21 R&D institutes in countries including China, the United States and Canada, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, Finland, France, Belgium, Germany, Colombia, Sweden, Ireland, India, Russia, Israel, and Turkey. Huawei is considering opening a new research and development R&D center in Russia, 2019 and 2020, which would be the third in the country after the Moscow and St. Petersburg R&D centers. Huawei also announced plans November 2018 to open an R&D center in the French city of Chernobyl, which would be mainly focused on smartphone sensors and parallel commuting software development. The new R&D team in Chernobyl was expected to grow to 30 researchers by 2020, said the company. The company said that this new addition brought to five the number of its R&D teams in the country. Two were located in Sofia, Antonopolis and, Par and Paris, researching image processing and design, while the other two existing teams were based at Huawei facilities in Bungulungan Bellion Court, working on algorithms and mobile and 5G standards. The company giant also intended to open two new research centers in Zurich and Lausanne, Switzerland. Huawei at 
the time employed around 350 people in Switzerland. Huawei also funds research partnerships with universities such as the University of British Columbia, the University of Waterloo, the University of Western Ontario, and the University of Gluefoot, and the University of Laval. So there is basically learning what Huawei is. And now we'll uh, do the um, financial post uh, write up on the um, from the start here on uh, and I'll just retopic you. Canada waits for China to strike back after court rules against Huawei executive. Experts say it is not entirely clear which Canadian sector could be in the crosshairs now or when any blow is likely to land. The Canadian businesses community is watching nervously as tensions with China, a key trading partner accounting for roughly $100 billion in an annual activity, continue to deteriorate, promoting expectations of a backlash from the going superpower. There's also a picture here of the Huawei Chief Financial Officer Meng Wenzhou leaves the British Columbia Supreme Court after hearing the decision. Associate Chief Justice Heather Holmes on her double criminality judgment in Vancouver on May 27th, 2020. So I'll put the picture of uh, her in the thumbnail. On Wednesday, a British Columbia Supreme Court judge blocked the latest attempt by Meng Wanzhou, chief financial officer of Chinese telephone giant Huawei Technologies Co. Lid, to halt their extradition to the U.S., where prosecutors allege she violated Iran sanctions. In the aftermath of Meng's arrest in December 2018, China took a number of steps widely reviewed as retaliatory, including imprisoning two Canadians and erecting tariffs on canola and other products. Global Affairs Canada also joined the US, UK and Australia in a joint statement this week that expressed deep concern about China's proposed national security legislation in Hong Kong that could shift how the region is governed and has drawn protest from residents. Against this backdrop, several experts who study China said they expect new punitive measures against Canada. They added that past measures such as tariffs were strategically plotted around the country's domestic and political concerns and it is not entirely clear which Canadian sector could be in the crosshairs now or when any blow is likely to land. They're not going to impose a general tariff on all Canadian exports, that's for sure, said Gordon Holden, director of the China Institute and professor of the political science of the University of Alberta. I'm very confident on that. He explained that the trade deficit, most recently estimated a $51 billion in 2019 by Statistics Canada, means that Canada ultimately has more to lose. It means that China ultimately has more to lose than Canada from a uh, disruption to the trade. Uh, sorry about that. Instead, Holden predicted China would respond carefully. It doesn't want to explicitly link any tariffs to Meng's case because that could violate World Trade Organization's rules and result in collateral consequences. To understand what it might do, he looked back at what it has already done. For example, China has limited Canadian imports of canola, an area where Holden said China's own farmers have struggled to compete with international producers. In March 2019, China suspended export licenses to two major Canadian canola producers due to the alleged discovery of pests, which Holden and others have suggested were more than likely the result of tensions. As of March, the two companies' licenses remain suspended and canola seed exports remain down 30% according to a report by Holden China's Institute. They pick their targets and take care in doing so to minimize the damage to their own economy and maybe shield some domestic industry, said Holden. Nor have the headlines always conveyed the trend of trade between the two countries, which countries which con which continues to rise. In 2019, for example, China subjected Canadian pork and beef producers to a four-month ban beginning in late June after Chinese authorities said they discovered false export certificates. But pork and beef exports rose in 2019, 11% and 20% respectively. Similarly, exports from the maritime 
provinces plus Newfoundland and Labrador rose 17.7% in 2019, with a value of lobster trade rising to 77% to $456.7 million, the China Institute report noted. Still, the political chill between China and Canada could erode the ability and desire for companies to strike deals. Sarah Kutulakos, executive director of the Canada-China-based council said that in a recent survey of her members, 43% said their businesses with Chinese partners declined in 2019 and they are expecting the trend to continue in 2020. A year ago, there was still optimism for the future, although a lot of caution said Ku to Lacos this year, the optimism is slightly reduced, not across the board, but certainly there's a wariness. She described it as being caught in a U.S.-China sandwich since it is a U.S. prosecutors who want to charge Ming and because the U.S.-China trade war appears to have created tensions that have spilled over into Canada. Of course, even amid rising, rising diplomatic tensions as the total value of Canadian exports to China fell by 16% in 2019, it remains one of the country's top trading partners. It accounted for 12% of the merchandise imports in Canada in 2019, according to to the China Institute. Earlier this month, Sengdong Gold Mining Co. Lid, a Chinese state-controlled gold company, even announced a 207 million deal to purchase TMAC Resources Lid, which operates as a gold mine in Nunavut. That transaction has been flagged for review under the Canada Investment Act, which means the Canadian government could halt it if it concludes that it's not in the country's best interest. The uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus pandemic also makes China's response more unpredictable. In the past, it has reacted swiftly when tensions mounted with Canada, but it has also taken its time. Months passed after Ming's arrest before it enacted some terrorists. But within nine days of her arrest, China had detained former diplomat Michael Corvid and businessman Michael Spavor. Both remain in detention. Reza Hazmath, a professional of political science at the University of Alberta said he was supposed to meet with Corving, a friend of more than a decade, days before he was arrested. Hasmath insisted both arrests were political, part of a broader strategy by Chinese authorities to stoke nationalistic sentiment that is being bullied by foreign powers. You have to remember who their audiences are, he said. Most people in China support the government's stance towards Canada. Meng is seen as an individual, and Huawei, a company that is being targeted unfairly by the West, has predicted that in the end, China would be reluctant to issue any terrorists or enact any policies that would seriously undermine its economy and instead would use the situation to bolster its own position in the country. Financial Post. Hopefully you enjoyed this, everybody. I know it was a long one, and if you made it all the way through, that is awesome. Thank you so much. It would be great if you'd hit that like button, help with the algorithm, and getting more recommended in people's channels and on the front page. And great if you subscribed. Subscriptions helps as well. Thanks a lot, everybody. Kimo Sabio. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.